Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It is 7.30, so we are, I'm sorry, 7 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started uh, in respect for everybody's time. I did want to let you know, all know before we jump into it that um, we do have you muted and your video is turned off. Please make sure that those stay that way. Uh, we should have settings that keep it that way, but just in case. Um, this is a public meeting, and so I don't think too, too many of you want, <laughs> want your faces all over the internet. Um, my name is Hillary Silverstone, and I am the Sustainability Coordinator here with the City of Deerfield Beach. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, tonight, we are having an informational presentation on iguanas in Deerfield Beach. Uh, iguanas have been in the city for quite some time now, and I know uh, personally have stirred up uh, some interest. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of folks are interested in, you know, how to deal with them, how to manage them, why they're here, and what to do um, if they're around. A lot of people consider them nuisances, etc. And so to answer all of your questions, we have invited the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to join us in hopefully answering a lot of those questions that you have tonight. Um, we will get started with about a 30 minute presentation and then we'll take your questions at the end. If you're on a computer, you can send your questions to us via the chat application. Um, the way you do that is at the in the Zoom tool at the bottom right, there is a, a chat option and you can send your questions to me, Hillary Silverstone. If you direct them to me, I'll be able to ask them at the end for you. Uh, if you are on a phone, um, we will take some questions via the phone towards the end of the presentation, if time permits. And in order to do this, you can raise your hand using star nine. Um, I will announce when that option is available. And like I said, we'll get through the questions that are coming through the chat tool first, and then we'll jump to those questions that uh, are through the hand raised option. I think that covers most of our housekeeping. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Jan Four from the FWC to give us a, an exciting presentation on Iguanas. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you, Deerfield Beach. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be here tonight and speak to you and share some information that hopefully you will find useful in understanding iguanas in our state and the management strategies that FWC is using to manage the populations and what you can do to be a part of that. So the first thing I'm going to do is stop my video so that I can share my screen. There we go. Okay. So I am Jan Four, and my role is the non-native fish and wildlife section um, education and outreach coordinator for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. And one of the wonderful things that I get to do is speak to the public about iguanas and provide technical assistance specifically to homeowners. But anyone in the audience tonight that is not a homeowner, hopefully you're going to get some really useful information out of this presentation. So we're just going to dive right in. The presentation, the technical assistance workshop is meant to empower homeowners to remove nuisance iguanas from their own private property. So we're going to tell you what you're authorized to do, how to do it. And we're also going to tell you the reasons why it's important that you do this if you choose to do so. So let's go forward. First of all, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission is tasked with protection and management of more than 575 species of wildlife and 700 fish species. Now, if you break that down, it's about 200 freshwater and about 500 marine fish species. And what we do are, uh, is to balance the needs of these natural resources with the needs of the millions of residents and visitors that we get to our state. So it's a big task and we're very happy to have the authority to do so. 
So what does that mean? If we're managing all of these resources, that means that we also need to manage non-native species in Florida. What's a non-native species? It's a species that is not naturally found in any of our ecosystems. So all those dots, those yellow dots that you see on this map, that's more than 110,000 individual animal sightings that are non-native species. Those are individual animals from 1924 to present day. This is a lot. If you break that down by species, you have over 500 species of non-native fish and wildlife that have been observed. And I want to stress this is credible, verified observations that we're talking about. Of those 500 species, at least 139 non-native species are established in Florida. They are breeding. They are able to increase their population numbers. And that's based on a literature review. So, okay, wait a minute, what does that mean? Is that bad that we have all these non-native species? Well, the invasion curve can answer that for you. So let's break this down. On the left-hand side, you'll see area infested. On the bottom, you'll see time. And on the right, you'll see control costs. So as the area infested grows over time, oh boy, control costs go up. So let's swing our attention back to the left side, prevention. Prevention is going to be one of our favorite preferred strategies for managing animals, because if we can prevent introduction, we don't have to worry about the rest of the invasion curve. So prevention is key in managing non-native species. Now, if species become introduced, and there are a variety of pathways where this can happen, prevention isn't perfect. What if an animal escapes? What if it's released? What if it hitchhikes into our state? There are a variety of ways it can get here. But now we're dealing with eradication, trying to remove those animals through those credified and credible and verified reports, or containing the spread of a non-native, now invasive species, or dealing with asset-based protection and long-term management. So that means managing the overall problem and protecting our native wildlife assets. And iguanas as you can see, fall into that last category. So let's talk about iguanas in Florida. We have three species that are known to be established in Florida. You may be familiar with that center one, the green iguana, that is one of the most common. We also have the Mexican spiny-tailed iguana and the black spiny-tailed iguana. These species are less common and they are difficult to uh, tell apart, very, very difficult, unless you're an iguana biologist. So I'm going to give you some background on both green iguana and the black spiny-tailed iguana for a specific reason. That species presents a series of impacts that shouldn't be overlooked. So let's find out what those are. First things first, black spiny-tailed iguanas. You can see a map. This isn't their established range. What this map represents are individual data points, individual sightings of this species. These are the credible verified sightings. So we know their established range is in multiple counties. We have Miami-Dade, Broward, there, there have been sightings in Palm Beach County. We have Collier-Lee counties. These are areas where their populations have grown. Any other dots that you see on this map are likely escaped or released pets. So when we talk about introduction, we want to prevent the possibilities of escape or release. It's illegal to release a non-native species in Florida. We'll get to that in a moment. But that's an idea of where you might have seen or we have seen black spiny-tailed iguanas. They're not native to Florida. They're native to Central America. And the males can reach up to four feet. They're omnivorous, and this is the point I really want to make with this particular species. Unlike the green iguana, which is herbivorous, this species is omnivorous. What does that mean? It's got a generalist diet. That means that it will eat a variety of food types. So rodents, bats, small birds, our gopher tortoise hatchlings, they have, this species has been documented eating gopher tortoise hatchlings. And if you didn't know, gopher tortoise, it, the gopher tortoise is a threatened species in the state of Florida. So this is an impact that is quite different from the green iguana. 
They can live in a variety of habitats. What that means is you can find them in, out in the wild. You can find them in urban areas in close proximity to humans. You can find them in disturbed areas. You can find them in burrows on the ground, in trees. This species particularly will run into burrows when it comes in contact with anything it perceives as threatening. So they can survive in a variety of habitats. That's very interesting. And they can also lay between 10 to 30 eggs per clutch. So a fairly high reproductive potential. Let's now look at green iguanas. The distribution is different. Look at the sightings, the credible verified observations that we've had. And I'm gonna show you more of those in a minute. Look up in the panhandle. They've even been sighted up there, which is unusual because of the cold factor. If you didn't already know, Green iguanas are not cold hardy. They cannot survive in multiple days of prolonged cold near freezing or freezing temperatures. So if we have a cold snap like we had in 2010, we may see impact to the green iguana, iguana population. But if we just have a little overnight, you know, one day cold snap, all it may do is cold stun them. And that's when you see news reports of them falling out of trees, things like that. So the dots that you see on this map. Again, look at the concentrations and you can see where established populations are located, but those other little dots are likely individual escaped or released pets. They are native to South and Central America. They're not native to Florida. They can grow up to six feet, a little bit bigger than the black spiny tailed, and they are known to be herbivorous. And that means they're going to eat a lot of plants, a variety, I should say, of plants. That can be ornamental plants, or that may be since uh, that may be native plant wildlife in Florida in ecologically sensitive areas. So that's an important impact that they may have as well. They live in a variety of habitats like the black spiny tail. Often we see them in trees, we can see them on the ground. You know that iguanas are excellent swimmers, so they may run into the water to escape something they perceive as a threat. Look at the reproductive potential for this species, 10 to 70 eggs per clutch. So we have an issue here. Green iguanas are considered invasive in Florida. Well, we've tossed out a couple of terms, non-native, invasive. Invasive means that they pose a set of impacts to the ecology, the economy, or human health and safety. So that's what that invasive term means. Florida is particularly susceptible to invasive species. So our subtropical climate is a lovely environment for them to uh, establish and gain a potential foothold as a species that's not native to the state. It aids in establishment because we have very few days of annual freeze, especially in South Florida. These animals have a high reproductive potential reproductive potential. So that means they can reproduce quickly, increase their population numbers quickly. That's maybe a negative thing. Let's look further into why they might be invasive. And they can occupy a variety of habitats. So they don't just need wild areas. They can occupy inhabited urban areas, disturbed areas, as we've mentioned before. Not only that, there are very few predators. There isn't anything native in Florida that regularly consumes iguanas. Though we've seen a bobcat take an iguana, we've seen other native species take an iguana. Nothing dines on iguanas as a regular staple of their diet. And they have very few competitors for the resources they use. So all of these things are suitable subtropical climate, this high reproductive potential, allowing them to expand their population, the ability to just about live anywhere, and the fact that nobody's out competing them and nobody's eating them means that they can become invasive very, very quickly and pose those impacts to human health and safety or the economy or ecology. We'll get back to that in a moment. Right now, I just wanna show you progression over time. The significance you'll see really quickly back in 1965 to 2000. So in that several decade range, this is what we saw. These are credible verified reports of iguanas, confirmed green iguana observations. Now let's fast forward just a few years. Now we're in 2003. Look, they're down in the Keys. There are multiple more sightings. So, okay, this is, this is a little bit concerning. Let's go forward four years, 2007. We're in central Florida now. Oh boy, 
Let's go forward, 2010, just three more years, and we have a vast amount of sightings going on. Now we're up in the panhandle. Did you notice that dot up there? There's a data point of significance. Again, that's likely escaped or released pet. Now we're into 2013, and you can see there's definitely the curve that we talked about. You can see these numbers are growing. That reproductive potential is fulfilling its potential. And now we're at 2017. And then finally, this was just updated for uh, 2020, over 10,000 credible verified reports of green iguanas. Look at all those individual sightings all over the state from the panhandle through central Florida down to South Florida, all over the Keys. And what I want to point out about that is that's just 10,000 reported credible verified sightings. That's not indicative of the entire population. There are more than 10,000. That's just what we, can, we have documented from our sources. So this is interesting, this is significant. So let's talk about those impacts. Understanding the impact that a non-native, particularly an invasive species has on the ecology, the economy or human health and safety helps us understand how to manage it and why it's necessary to manage it. So when we're talking about green iguanas, they're herbivores, they may eat ecologically sensitive plants. And what that means is that if an ecosystem is already sensitive, it's already challenged for a variety of reasons. This ecosystem is, is close to being or is already imperiled. The last thing you want is for an invasive species to come along and add any negative impact to that ecosystem. Another impact is this beautiful butter, butterfly. This is the Miami blue butterfly. And iguanas are known to eat the knicker bean leaf. Why is that significant? Because the endangered Miami blue butterfly uses the knicker bean leaf for its larval stage. So we're still working on understanding this relationship, but that can be a significant impact towards our endangered listed species. Another impact we have seen, even though green iguanas are a bit herbivorous, this lime tree snail, this is a species that has shown up in the stomach contents of iguanas taken from the wild. So trying to understand the impacts is very important to understanding how this animal can affect Florida ecology. Other impacts include economic impacts, and these are also significant. So it's not just ornamental plants, although that can result in hundreds to thousands, even millions of dollars in landscaping. We're talking about structures like seawalls. We're talking about patios and decks. These animals also are known to defecate on walkways, patios, decks, they may defecate in pools. Even more significant than is anything than anything pictured here are the impacts to major infrastructures like water control structures and roadways. Now we're talking severe damage and millions of dollars in managing and repairing those impacts. So what is the FWC doing to manage this? Well, in 2021, we've had a change to the regulatory status of iguanas. Previously, they were a class three species. Now they're going to be regulated as prohibited once the new rules take effect. Our commissioners voted to approve at our February commission meeting, and those new rules will take effect in the coming weeks. So what does that mean? If I'm a current owner, and I stress that a current owner, I'll need to apply for a permit. It's free. I'll need to pit tag my animal. That just means getting a microchip for that animal. And I'll need to update my caging, my biosecurity measures. I also can't acquire any new animals for personal possession. So I don't own a green iguana right now. Once these rules take effect, I will be prohibited from owning a green iguana. Once these rules take effect, there is also going to be no importation for breeding or commercial use. So if I had plans to start up a breeding and commercial use business, once these rules are in effect, I can't do that. Those that are already doing that, some sellers may qualify for a limited exception permit. And we can go over all of those things in detail. At the end of this PowerPoint is the website for our rule changes. And it has all the resources you need to understand the new invasive reptile rules that were just voted on. 
So if I'm not planning to own one as a pet, have one as a pet, what is that, or, or sell it, what does that mean? Can I remove them? I just want to help. Can I remove them? Yes, you can. Iguanas are not protected in the state of Florida, except by anti-cruelty law. So that means you have to humanely kill them. You can't torture them. You can't do anything like that. It has to be humane. Removal is allowed on private property with landowner permission. And when I say removal, we're going to get into what that means. You can't take it anywhere else. Removal is allowed on private property with landowner permission. Removal is also allowed on 25 managed lands year round without a permit or a hunting license per executive order 2017. This just happened last year. This is amazing. This is a public engagement strategy that allows you to go out and remove invasive reptiles on all of these lands, these 25 managed lands. And you don't have to acquire a permit. You don't need a hunting license. So this is an amazing way to gauge, engage the public in the uh, work that FWC is already doing to protect native wildlife and remove invasive wildlife. So how are we removing? How can you remove? Here's what's allowed. You can capture iguanas by hand. It is recommended that you wear some kind of glove protection, long pants, long sleeves. You can also use nets. You can use noose poles and snares, or the FWC recommends that you use cage traps. What can you not do? The methods that are not allowed, you cannot use inhumane types of traps. You cannot set leg hold or body gripping steel traps. It is also not legal to use gasoline, smoke, poison, chemicals of any type to drive iguanas from their burrows or their nests and cause them to move that way. So these methods are prohibited. Let's go back to the live capture traps because the FWC has some recommendations and there are some laws regarding live capture trap use. We recommend that you choose a large raccoon sized box style trap for use with iguanas. Remember the black spiny tail can be four feet, the green iguana can be six feet, so a larger trap is recommended. You also want to choose ripe, brightly colored non-citrus fruits as bait when you bait your trap. I didn't know that when I first started with the agency. So we're talking about iguanas having preferences for strawberries, bananas, watermelons, grapes, mangoes, less preference. It doesn't mean they won't eat it, but less preference for citrus-based fruits. There are also some recommendations for setting your live capture traps as to where and how and how often it should be checked. So when you set your trap, it should be done during the day to avoid bycatch of other species, native species like this raccoon here. You wanna set your traps in the shade and cover it with breathable materials so the animal is not exposed to the elements. We want to do this humanely. You need to check the traps at least once every 24 hours and that is a requirement by law. So what happens after that? If you've caught it by hand, if you've caught it with a snare, if you've caught it with a trap, what happens? It is illegal to relocate or introduce non-native species into Florida. So if anyone was tempted to trap it on your property and release it to the neighbor's property or take it down to the Walmart parking lot or release it into a, a wildlife area or an abandoned golf course, nope, all of that is illegal. All captured iguanas must be humanely euthanized. If you call a trapper, they may qualify for a permit to transport it off-site to humanely euthanize discreetly, but that's just some trappers who qualify. If you capture it, the iguana must be humanely euthanized. These animals do not make good pets, so they must be humanely euthanized. You cannot relocate it or release it elsewhere. So let's go over a summary of the information about disposing of iguanas. All wildlife species in Florida are protected by anti-cruelty laws. Euthanasia methods must be legal and humane. No poisons are legal for use on iguanas or any reptiles in Florida. You must humanely kill trapped iguanas or you can use the FWC search function. This is a feature on our website. If you're not comfortable doing this, okay. You can contact a wildlife trapper, a nuisance wildlife professional. We have a search function. We do not endorse anyone who has volunteered to list themselves in this feature, but it's available to you to easily find a wildlife trapper in your local area.
Now for homeowners, if you plan to dispatch these animals yourself, you can use firearms, but we recommend you check with local law enforcement offices for any firearms ordinances in your area before using firearms to dispose of iguanas. Now let's move on to what you can do. If you don't plan to trap and you don't wanna mess around with humanely killing, you have other options, especially homeowners. We're gonna talk about the methods for preventing these animals from taking up residence on your property, excluding them from the things you don't want them to, to damage or touch, how to deter them from living on your property and how to modify the habitat to make this all work for you. So let's dive in. The first rule of prevention is never feed them. Iguanas are always going to be attracted anywhere there's a food source. So if your property is particularly attractive, if you're offering them food, please don't do that. If you are unintentionally offering food, let's consider that for a minute. A lot of people feed cats or dogs or other animals in the neighborhood. Food may be left out. This is a temptation that you should consider removing because it may attract wildlife like iguanas. So if you don't want iguanas on your property, consider removing any food source. Now let's talk about other food sources. You may have valuable plants that iguanas would care to eat. Those may be desirable food types for them. Ornamental vegetation, fruits and vegetables. You can cage or screen these plants and prevent iguanas from making contact with them. So these are exclusion methods by installing barriers. Another barrier that's commonly seen in Florida are these sheet metal wraps around trees to prevent climbing. And usually they're just off the ground, about 18 inches from the base to make it more difficult for the iguana to get over above around this barrier. So that's the ideal setting placement for this sheet metal barrier. So you can exclude iguanas from anything you don't want them to come into contact with. You can also exclude them from digging. As we've mentioned, iguana species are excellent diggers. They dig burrows. So if you want to prevent that under your decks, your patios, your sea walls, if you want to prevent that under your foundation, you can install wire fence barriers, but it is recommended that you bury these barriers several inches deep into the ground. Just installing the barrier is not good enough. The iguana can burrow under it. So go 12, 18 inches underneath the ground to ensure it's an excellent usable barrier. Also electric fencing is another option to exclude iguanas from particular areas of your of your property. The other thing that you might want to do is exclude them from making a home out of your structures on your property, including your house structure. So if you remove any unintentional bridges, tree limbs, anything that would allow an iguana to, they're excellent climbers. You, so if you remove those, they can't climb over to your home structure. Now we'll take a look at a couple of videos of deterrence. So anything that is a, a harassment deterrent to an iguana, like loud, startling noises. Oops, sorry, let's go back, my fault. Loud, startling noises, think music, think talk radio at a loud volume if you're able to do that without upsetting your neighbors. And then you want to think of things like this. This is a water scarecrow, so a sudden burst of water, it's loud, it's, it's um, shocking to the animal, so it's something that they will want to avoid, and that's what makes it a deterrent. Let's go to the other video here. So we have, if it'll go. It's thinking, it's thinking real hard, gang. So another video that's coming up is a resident. Here we are, oops. We'll go back to sharing the screen and get you back on that video. As soon as we can open this PowerPoint. Thanks for being patient, everybody. We're just going to reopen our PowerPoint here, get you right back to where we started. So the video that we're going to watch is a resident just using a simple water hose, one of those pump sprayers. You probably have one in your garage. It's not anything that's going to hurt the animal. All it means is that the animal is going to get an unpleasant dose of water to the face. All right, here we go. Now I can go back to sharing my screen to the face, to the body. Anything that will drive the animal away, anything that it wants to avoid is a good deterrent. So let's share our screen. Here we go. 
Hopefully you guys will be able to see this. And let's go back to presenter mode. Here we go. There we go, PowerPoint, good job. We'll take a look here. It's just a simple pump sprayer. That's all that's needed. It's not gonna hurt the animal. It's just to deter the animal and make the area uninhabitable. That's all you want to do. No harm to the animal, just make it less appealing to take up residence. Jen, just so you know, we can't see your screen right now. Oh, goodness, okay. Stopping sharing, and we'll just repeat that process really quickly here. Thanks for being patient, everyone. Let's go back to our browser. Share screen. We'll get this loaded up here, guys. Hillary, can you confirm? Can you see anything resembling an iguana yeah. PowerPoint? You can? Yep. Yeah, we see your PowerPoint. Oh, fantastic. That's always the, the answer you want to hear, isn't it? <laughs> this is another deterrent that I find interesting. I have quite a few CDs sitting around my apartment at the moment. I have quite a collection. And this is a wonderful way to repurpose them and also use them as an invasive species deterrent. So you hang these. They have a light reflective pattern. They're also uh, swinging in the breeze. So there's something that the animal is likely to avoid. Now, one of the things that's key to understanding this deterrent is you wanna switch up the position every now and then to make them less predictable. If the animal learns how to navigate around them and just simply avoid them, then it's no longer an effective deterrent. Now, this is my favorite one to talk about. When we modify habitat, we're gonna swing the pendulum both ways here. So the first swing is going to be remove anything that could be an iguana hotel. So things like dense thickets, any kind of cover like rock piles, piles of landscape material, mulch, dirt, sand. If you can consider removing these from your property because they just invite burrowing from these animals, especially when you're considering nests. So if they're gonna see that and think that's an ideal nesting habitat, remove it. Now, this is interesting. Let's swing the pendulum the other way. What if you consider building mulch or sand piles, especially in areas like seawalls where these animals are known to congregate and nest. If you encourage iguanas to nest in these areas, you can then participate in population control. Once nesting has completed, then you can take those eggs, you can remove them, destroy them either by freezing or compressing with pressure and seal them in a plastic bag and dispose of them. So thereby preventing further iguana population increase. Now let's talk about additional habitat modification. All of the plants that I like to have, hibiscus, or orchids, roses, all of the greens. I love trying to grow my own food. I'm not great at it, but I love it. I have a basil plant that's mm, kind of on the fence right now, but that basil plant has something that iguanas truly love. It has, when it's healthy, it has fresh leaves on it. These are leaves that are gonna be higher in protein content and they're gonna be lower in cellulose content, which is harder to digest. So these are things that are favorable to iguanas. Everything on this slide is something that the iguana may want to eat. What about undesirable plants? So iguana resistant plants, milkweed, oleanders, and citrus. There's that citrus note again. How unusual and, and different is that? And the reason why is these plants have tough, thick leaves, more cellulose, harder to digest, less protein. So consider these as iguana resistant plants and things that you can keep on your property. Now, what options do we have for pet owners? The non-native section for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission runs the exotic pet amnesty program. That means during the year, we host multiple amnesty day events in a normal year. And you can surrender, uh, the public are welcome to surrender iguanas at these events. There's no penalty and there's no fee. How nice is that? We also provide year round adoption assistance. If you can't wait for an exotic pet amnesty day event, no problem. We have a hotline, it's 888, I've got one. And we also have the ability for you to email the program directly and request a surrender. We have approved adopters and we will facilitate the surrender to approval or to adoption process with our approved adopters through the pet amnesty program. 
So thank you so much for your time. Again, I want to stress that if you have questions that you don't get answers to during today's presentation, there's my email. Hillary also has it, and she's welcome to share it with you. We have resources for you to go online and learn more. We have an iguana species profile page. We have this workshop. We also have our brand new pages regarding the new rules for invasive reptiles. And you can navigate to any of these simply by Googling FWC non-native. It'll take you right to our non-native homepage. You can get to everything, to the rules, to the iguana page, to the pet amnesty page, all of it. So thank you so much, guys. I'm going to stop sharing. I appreciate your patience during the technical difficulties, and I will turn my camera back on as well. Here we go. Start video. Did we make it through, Hillary? We did. Woo! <laughs> thank you so much, Jan. Um, actually, your video hasn't turned back on yet, but that's okay. <laughs> Working on it. Working on it. <laughs> So I have a, a small collection of questions here. I'm going to run through them. Um, some of them are kind of situational um, and a little bit hard to summarize. So I might have to read through the whole thing. I did want to let everyone know that I pasted in the chat box um, Jan's email address as well as mine with the city. So if anyone has any questions that don't get answered tonight, feel free to um, send an email to myself or to Jan and we'll uh, work to make sure we get those addressed for you. So um, the first question that I have here is specific to eating iguana um, and uh, it references that, uh, that people, some, some cultures eat iguanas and is that a way that we can address this issue? Is it okay to eat them? Is it humane to kill them and eat them, etc.? I'll answer the last part first. As long as they were humanely killed, then if you want to eat them, that is a personal choice. Uh, unlike Burmese pythons, which are shown so far to have potentially high levels of mercury, that hasn't been an issue with iguanas. So if that's something that you want to do, it has been proposed many times that iguanas could be used as a sustainable food source. And FWC is always open to partnering with agencies at, any entity that is interesting, interested in doing more with this idea. So that's a personal choice and you can go right ahead. Thanks, Jan. Um, this is actually maybe a question that our uh, Lieutenant Adam Hosking may be able to answer. Um, I'm gonna unmute you, uh, Lieutenant Hosking, if you are there. I am, good evening. Hi there. Hi. Um, this question, um, a person asked if we can use uh, BB guns or air rifles to shoot iguanas, and that'll probably be a combination question between you and Dan. So thanks for having me tonight. Um, most importantly, I'm going to echo what uh, Jan said. The most important thing is, you know, first and foremost, regardless of whether a species is invasive or not, the same statute and law apply regarding um, animal abuse um, and also the use of firearms, etc. So there's no special exceptions. And that being said, the most important thing to reiterate is no animals can be killed in a cruel or inhumane manner. Not only is it law, but it's something we don't want to encourage. I mean, now I'm currently your executive officer or assistant chief, if you will, but in my past life here at BSO, I supervised the animal abuse unit. So um, animals do hold a special place to my heart. And yes, there are nuisance animals and invasive species. And uh, I get it. They can cause some people hardships, but um, it's not acceptable to kill an animal in a inhumane manner. So that being said, uh, first and foremost, firearms cannot be discharged at all anywhere within the city limits for anything other than personal defense uh, or any situation where you must protect your life or the life of another. So when it comes to air guns and pellet rifles, they are not considered firearms. Uh, they can be lawfully used on your property, for example. Now, where I caution people, it's very important, and you've probably seen enough of these scenarios in the news. Um, these days, you know, a pellet gun or a rifle um, can be indistinguishable from a regular firearm. 
So some of the problems we encounter are folks who go out iguana hunting, which, which you can do. Um, and I'm also going to elaborate and say that Florida has some liberal laws when it comes to open carry when hunting. So yes, for example, you could go on a hunting expedition in your neighborhood or a public area and hunt an invasive species, for example, and carry a rifle. But anybody should know common sense these days, there's a lot of perils that go along with that. Uh, people are going to call and say, hey, there's a person walking around with a rifle and what's their intent? So I don't want to see anyone put themselves in a dangerous situation, dangerous for themselves, dangerous for law enforcement, dangerous for others. So I caution anyone that is leaving the confines of their personal or enclosed property um, and I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Is somebody unmuted or is that me? Dan, you may want to mute. Thank you. Sorry, that's better. Great. Um, so anyway, I just caution people that yes, you can go to places outside of your property and shoot an invasive species with an air gun or a pellet rifle or a BB gun. Um, but again, do at your own risk and be aware of the perils that go along with that. And you can do the same in your property. Now, the act of actually shooting the animal, again, it must be done in a humane manner. Pellet guns, BB guns, and air rifles do not guarantee that you're killing something in a humane manner. As a matter of fact, it could be downright inhumane and cause an animal cruel pain, suffering, and death, which is wrong morally. Uh, and also, statutorily, it's against the law. So what does that mean? Um, it, it, don't go out with a crossman garbage, you know, Walmart special BB gun that's not going to kill an animal cleanly, swiftly. Um, instead, it's, it's just going to torture it. And that's the problem we see with the kids. So no, I don't encourage the use of BB guns. If you know what you're doing and argumentably, you know, I just have to be objective here and honest in my answer. If you've got an air rifle uh, with a high velocity and air rifles these days, you know, velocity at 1200 feet plus is equivalent to that of a 22 caliber rifle. So obviously there you gotta be really careful because you don't hit your mark, you may hit something behind it. So that's another thing people need to be mindful of when they're shooting high powered rifles. So if you're going to attempt to humanely kill an invasive species such as an iguana, yes, first and foremost, you need to use a proper air rifle that has a high velocity and the proper kind of pellet that's not going to cause the animal suffering. Um, it's going to have to be a one-shot kill. So you have to be really good shot. Uh, and air rifles aren't like regular rifles. And I'm, I'm putting these details in here because people need to be aware of that because it's frustrating when folks just take it upon themselves to go buy a, a Walmart special air rifle and start shooting things and, and causing pain and suffering to animals or God forbid, shooting through the neighbor's windows or hurting people or passing cars. So these are all the things people need to be mindful of. Um, and again, if you're going to shoot that animal, yeah, it's got to be a one-shot kill. If you leave it injured or maimed, you are technically violating the law. So um, I, I think that kind of sums it up without going off on too many tangents. Um, Jan, do you want to echo off of that? Anything I missed in your opinion? Thank you, sir. That was amazing. Exactly what we needed. I appreciate that. Great. I hope that helps folks. Um, and by the way, if I could just add one thing here, uh, I know it's a big forum. We have a lot of folks. I'm always available uh, for anybody who has questions offline. If it's something you're not comfortable posing tonight or you want to talk to me one or one, um, I'm here at Deerfield Beach BSO. Um, I'm just going to rattle this out real quickly. If you want to jot it down, feel free. Our email addresses are simple. It's our first name underscore last name. So I can be reached at Adam underscore, little underscore symbol on your keyboard, Hofstein, 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 either way. And it's at Sheriff, S-H-E-R-I-F-F dot O-R-G. So Adam underscore Hofstein at Sheriff.org. So if you have further questions, um, please feel free. I'm your assistant chief here. I'm happy to help you with any issues you might have, but especially this, because again, I'm an animal guy and uh, I just want to make sure People know what they're doing and they're not causing any animals to suffer unnecessarily.
Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, that was a, a great answer. And it, just for everyone's knowledge, I did uh, paste uh, Lieutenant Hofstein's um, email address into the chat box as well. So if anyone wants to take that down, you have that uh, for your reference. Um, I know that we covered the next question a little bit in that answer, but um, if, if either of you could help us with what methods are considered humane for killing an iguana. Um, you know, we talked about the, what Lieutenant Hofstein said with, uh, with the one shot uh, option. Um, is there anything else that people should be aware of, Jan? Anything that you can do to ensure that the brain dies quickly. So we can go over some of those if you want. Um, if you would like more information, you can email me. But with firearms, that's one of the reasons why they are uh, a preferred method, because if you can get the one shot, one kill that the lieutenant was talking about, you ensure brain destruction. I will give you, um, you know, decapitation might seem quick and relatively painless, but that brain will need to be ensured that it is destroyed after decapitation. So if that makes it more or less palatable to you than a firearm, okay. Anything that is inhumane is gonna fall under poison, drowning, strangling, uh, electrocution, anything like that, that is a prolonged, cruel and unnatural death, that's going to fall under inhumane. And if I may, can I interject one thing? Jan's absolutely right. But again, the catch folks is firearms cannot be discharged um, within the confines of the city limits. I say the city limits because I can't speak for any other city, although I can pretty much tell you it's, it's common everywhere. Uh, sure, there are places you could go, preserves and whatnot, where you can discharge firearms, but there is no exception within the city limits of Deerfield Beach to discharge a firearm um, so that's the catch 22. Yes, that's the best method, but you can't do it. So there lies again, we'll apply the pellet rifle, if you will, to what Jan was saying. It's got to be a brain, a headshot, if you will. You got to hit the brain. You got to shut it all down. If you hit the body, you're going to torture. The animal's not going to die from that. They're going to have a gaping wound and they're going to suffer immensely. So that's the challenge here, folks. All right, thank you for those answers. Um, moving away from that subject, um, this is a, a pretty simple question. Uh, and I think, Jan, you can answer it quickly. Do iguanas like bird seed? I have never been asked that question before. What I can tell you is that Iguanas can be, especially black spiny-tailed iguanas that are more omnivorous and generalist predators, but we have seen this with green iguanas too. They can be opportunistic predators. So if the opportunity arises, other food sources are not available, that is a possibility. Have I seen it widely documented? No, but it is a food source that I would monitor. It is a food source that I would not leave out if I was worried about inviting iguanas onto my property. Great, thanks, Jan. The next question is in reference to, um, and if you can go back on mute for me, Jan. <laughs> Sorry, there's a little bit of feedback. Um, is in reference to laws uh, or, or rules regarding trapping iguanas on private, uh, home properties versus uh, at condos. Um, the, the comment was that it seems that rules for iguanas seem different for private homes versus condo complexes. Uh, this person was told that they were not allowed to, um, not allowed to trap iguanas on a condo property. Can you address that comment and question? Absolutely, and I'm going to introduce you to my boss who's also on this call, Sarah Funk. Uh, who can address it even better than I can. Um, but they're, they're, the difference is that if it's my property or if it's my neighbor's property and I have landowner permission, I can hunt and trap iguanas there and humanely kill and remove them. But if I'm going to do it on a condo, like for my condo complex, I would have to get condominium approval to do that. I'm gonna let Sarah chime in so that she can weigh in on all the nuances of this, if we can, if we can find her and unmute her. 
Sarah, I'm going to ask you to unmute now. I got it. Hello, everyone. So yeah, Jan's correct in that response. And the only thing I would really add, um, again, just emphasizing, emphasizing to ensure you have that landowner permission to do any kind of trapping before you do it. So that's key. And you cannot trap iguanas or anything on public lands. So our WMAs, national parks, state parks, et cetera, unless you have typically a permit from those um, land managing agencies to do so. And that brings me to our recent rule changes as well. The one thing that wasn't covered in Jan's wonderful presentation tonight was, um, it, it truly is a little tiny nuance thing, but it's gonna be brand new because now the iguanas are a prohibited, or they will be soon, a prohibited species in the state of Florida, which means you can't live transport these animals around in a trap, in a bag, in your car, in any way, shape or form without a permit. So when Jan emphasized that if they're trapped on a property, they must be killed on site, she was absolutely correct. Now, that being said, these rule changes aren't in effect for another couple of weeks. We're going through the administrative process behind the scenes right now to get everything codified into rule. So it's going to be a little bit yet until they're officially considered prohibited, but that will mean that they're highly regulated by the state and cannot be live transported for the purposes of euthanasia. So you can't drive it to the vet. You won't be able to drive it down the road. Um, again, if you trap it on site, it's going to have to be killed on site. However, there will be an exception, and that is our new eradication and control permit. So if you or um, someone you know who is a trapper who does this for a living wants to continue to do that work where they trap iguanas and take them to an off-site facility for the purposes of humane euthanasia, they can get one of these free permits from the FWC to continue doing this very important work. So just because these are going to become a prohibited species here in the next few weeks doesn't mean that suddenly all the trappers that are out there are going to be doing something illegal. That's absolutely not going to be the case. They will have to obtain those eradication and control permits, again, so they can live transport those animals to an off-site facility for the purposes of humane euthanasia. And it kind of makes sense, you know, if, if you want to do that in a discreet fashion, which I hope most of them will, um, you don't want to do that in the public eye. You're not going to want to do that necessarily on the property of the person that, you know, hired you to do that kind of work. You're going to want to do that discreetly. So that's really our intent with that permit is to further support those efforts by those trappers while giving them the opportunity to do their work discreetly. However, going back to what Jan said originally, if you kill that iguana on site on private property where you have permission, you would not need one of these permits. It's just for that live transport piece. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah and Jan, for those answers. Um, the next question, I, I only, I know we're getting close to our end time of eight o'clock. There are just a few more questions. We might end up going over just a few minutes. I hope that's all right. Um, but I'm going to try to get through these questions as quickly as we can. Um, the next question has to do with, uh, it's kind of a, a, a two-parter. Um, one, how do you legally dispose of, of euthanized iguanas? So if you have one that's been euthanized on your property. And then the second one is in reference to a, dealing with a disposed iguana, someone that has a neighbor who is throwing them into uh, the local canals um, and whether this is allowed or not. Oh, definitely. I appreciate that question. It's definitely a tough issue. They should, there are no rules, laws uh, that I'm aware of, and I'll let Sarah chime in if there are, um, regarding how. So they can be disposed of in waste receptacles. However, common courtesy to our neighbors is super important. And it is ideal that those would be bagged, potentially double bagged to reduce any decay and smell and things like that. Just being courteous of your neighbors. Um, I don't believe there are, it doesn't seem like the most positive practice to throw them in the canals. Uh, I don't believe there are any 
rules governing that, and I'll let the lieutenant weigh in if he knows differently. Um, it is a potential food source for other wildlife if they choose to eat it. So hopefully it will serve as a meal elsewhere. But it's definitely one of the things that we would like to emphasize if we're going to encourage members of the public to go out and trap or kill humanely these animals, then dispose of them with some care and some consideration for those around you. But I know of no laws that prevent the activities that you discussed. Oh yes, and definitely check with um, waste management for your local area to be certain. They may have different guidelines for different city ordinances for waste management. We actually do not recommend throwing uh, throwing the iguanas into the canals. Um, this is this is not permitted. So just to, to thank you cover that one. Um, we can't. You can put them into your garbage can. Okay, um, next question uh, regarding a, a resident who has um, the iguanas climbing up window screens and uh, screened patios. Is there a recommendation to keep them when they're digging into the pat into the screen and, and damaging the screens? Is there any recommendations for keeping them away? Excellent question. You can get creative with the types of deterrents that you use. You can try any of the ones featured here, but remember those are just a selection of the possibilities. So I would consider depending on, without having seen the actual window in the area, I would suggest preventing climbing with a barrier below, around it, above it, wherever the climbing is occurring. I would suggest installing any kind of exclusion barrier similar to the ones you saw in the presentation that prevent that activity completely. If you can make below the window a slippery surface, can you install a little bit of sheet metal? Is it unsightly? I don't know. But if that's a possibility, can you hang the CDs? You can make it an art project with your kids if you want to. There are all kinds of options and the sky's the limit on your creativity with how you want to disguise those things or publicly show them on your property if you want to make them fun and inviting for humans. But a, a deterrent that is effective for iguanas. But if they're climbing on the screens and damaging your screens, a climb barrier seems to be the best solution. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, this is kind of a similar question, um, just deterring iguanas from getting onto the roofs of homes. Um, a resident mentioned that they cut back all their screens, all their trees and put screens on downspouts for uh, gutters. Is there anything else that might be recommended um, specific to getting up on the roof? It sounds like the owner is already making several attempts to deter the animals. And if you're already doing those things, remember these animals are excellent climbers, so they don't necessarily need a bridge. Um, it would be ideal to evaluate the climbing features that are around the home, possibly on the corners where it might be easier for these animals to gain a traction and a foothold. Are there any ways to make drain pipes, corners more slick? Can you either add anything or sand down surfaces or consider a course of a few days, potentially weeks, of when you're watering your lawn, adding a deterrent from those sprays, those sprinklers, those hoses. So adding something, if you know the climbing areas or you know the origin of where they're climbing, can you add one of the other deterrents? If you're already doing the climbing exclusions, can you add a little bit more of a harassment to invite the iguanas to seek somewhere else to go. Is there anything you could install on the roof like a water scarecrow, if it's possible, or similar that might make it a negative experience for that animal to go on that roof? Why is it up there anyway? What is it after? These are all questions that we can investigate and, and um, ask ourselves as property owners to say, what can I do? I, I've done the things that were in the slides. What else can I do? So look beyond the, the obvious and try to figure out what is the attractant and can I do something about the attractant? Okay, the last question that I have here through the chat box. Um, 
I'm just going to to kind of read this this question out to you. Um, I think we've all heard about the Komodo dragon, who's famous for its uh, infectious bite. Um, so, do iguanas represent any kind of danger to humans if they attack or bite? Um, any infections related to that, etc. <laughs> Excellent question. I'm very glad you asked this. I keep telling my dog, the iguana is going to bite you if you keep doing what you're doing because she is an excellent iguana harasser. The FWC should hire her. So <laughs> the answer is no, there is nothing in that animal other than it has a mouth. It is capable of biting. Those are very sharp teeth. Yes, it can cause damage. Are iguanas known to bite without being harassed by humans? No. So they do pose a threat to ourselves, our children, our pets. We want to make sure that we keep ourselves, our children, our pets away from iguanas. So I don't let my dog go off leash because I know what she's going to do and she's likely to get bitten. But they don't pose the same risks as the Komodo dragon. We are just talking about physical injury at the bite site. Okay, thank you, Jan. I did want to circle back real quick on the question regarding throwing iguanas into the canal. This is actually considered illegal dumping. Um, the canals are not, uh, not your private property, and so therefore this is not something that is permissible. So I just want to emphasize that they can't go in the garbage can. Um, got a couple, a few, a few more questions uh, rolling in. Um, I'm going to try to kind of breeze through these. Um, Jan, do they make my pool water unsafe? They can make it uh, unsavory uh, by defecating in it. And there is the potential for these animals to carry and um, transmit salmonella bacteria. But other than the possible, and it's a relatively low risk, but it is something to be aware of. So. The chlorine should do its job, but I would, as a property owner with a pool, I would want to do whatever I could to deter these animals from swimming in that area. Okay, um, next question. Are there any motion sensor sprinkler heads that we can use to deter iguanas? Do you know of any technology like that? Absolutely. They're often used for birds, uh, other wildlife. Uh, many of your do-it-yourself DIY stores and chains carry a variety of these. You can shop online for these, but they are triggered. You can set them for a variety of activities depending on what model you've purchased, but you can set these to trigger when the field the um, trigger field, the vision field of this apparatus, if anything crosses that path. So remember, different models may trigger by anything, a native bird, yourself, your pet. That may not be an issue depending on where you've set it to spray, but it is a possibility that you will get more triggers than just the iguanas. But yes, several models exist for this, these water scarecrow, motion activated water features. Several models are available. Okay, and uh, one last question here, um, specific to uh, something that iguanas eat. Do you know if they eat pentas, the flower? Yeah, uh, yes, that was actually in one of our slides, the uh, pentas, and I'm just going to bring it up to make sure I quote it. It is a, an iguana resistant plant. So um, that is good information to have if you want to give iguanas an undesirable plant, something that they're not likely to dine on. It doesn't mean that they won't. It just means the cellulose content is higher and the protein is lower in plants like pentas, like citrus, like oleander. So these are desirable plants to modify your habitat to prevent iguanas from taking up residence on your property. Great, thank you. Um, so if there is anyone on the call that has not had an opportunity to ask a question and they'd like to raise their hand before we close out, um, you can do so now. Remember, if you're on the phone, you can hit star nine to raise your hand. I am going to share our screen quickly um, to show you where on the city website you can find information about iguanas. 
Um, just bear with me for just a moment. Here we go, share. So this is, Jan, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so on the city website, that's deerfield-beach.com or dfb.city. Uh, you can use either way to get to the city website under residents. You can navigate to wildlife management and this has information on both the green iguanas as well as coyotes. Um, some of you may have joined us for the coyote presentation a couple of weeks ago. Um, this does provide some of that information. Um, and you can also find, for those that have asked, a copy of this presentation on the, uh, the city YouTube page. Um, tonight's presentation won't be available quite yet. Um, but it will, should be available sometime tomorrow afternoon, uh, possibly through the weekend. Um, so just give us a, a, a little bit to get that up and available. Um, and uh, and we, we should have that. I know a couple questions came through asking if there was a recording. So the answer is yes, and it will be on the city website. Um, I do have one question that came through uh, just quickly from Randall. Uh, Benston, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you can ask your question. Randall, you there? All right. Looks Hello? Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. You just answered my question, though. I wanted to know where I could see the recording. Thanks so much. Okay, yep. Okay, yes, yeah, so that, that will be available. And just for anyone that's interested, the Coyote uh, presentation is also available on the city website that is there now. So if anyone has an interest in that, um, you can pull that up as well. Remember, I did paste uh, my email address as well as Jan's email address in the chat. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions following uh, following the, this presentation. And I think that uh, that concludes our evening. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you on our next uh, wildlife presentation. Thank you.